Hi, I'm Bird Weiss with Folsom Lake College's Literary and Arts magazine. And today I'm going to be joined by Dean Novak Oken to talk about his poem, Nuptial Flight. Hi, Dean. Hi, Bird. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for having it's me. It's so good. It's so good to see you. Um, so I know what this poem's about. Um, do you want to give a little bit of background to the listeners? about what we are talking about here? Yeah. Um, so for the past two years, I have been attending Lewis and Clark College. Um, and since moving to Portland from Southern California, um, it, I've had a lot of like, both like a physical journey across um, the country moving, um, but also like emotional. And my body has also been transforming as I'm a, oh, yeah. uh, a trans author. Um, and so nuptial flight is really sort of an exploration of like what this sense of movement um, means to me. Um, and in my second year of college, I started actually taking poetry courses to sort of refine my skills. And all of these poems um, come out of my uh, my time uh, there at LC. Um, and in Nuptial Flight, I sort of invoke the imagery of the, the woods of Portland, Oregon. Um, but I'm also reflecting on my process as a poet uh, of writing sort of being this form of how I take my emotions and like boil down anger um, from this like fire to this thing that I sort of have in control that maybe still isn't fully understandable to me and is still kind of falling apart. Um, but those pieces are, are there and they all sort of um, come together in this mismatched form of poetry. So I love the way you describe that. One of the things that I have always noticed reading your poetry is you always one of, one of the biggest themes that you have throughout all your poetry is this theme of being trapped and being free usually somehow at the same time and I think a yeah. lot of that is the thing that is invoking that cage on you are your feelings about a situation which you know you're allowed to have but it's not, mm -hmm. it doesn't feel right still. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've, I've spent a lot of my life trying to understand my own emotions and like who I am in relation to them um, and how I can both um, work with them and sort of push against them. You know, it's, it's all a, a game in that manner, but, um, but yeah, I really, especially being a trans author, um, tend to think of this metaphor commonly of the body as a cage and a prison, yeah. but also something in the sense that it is something that I am stuck in. Um, but it is up to right. me to like mold that, um, and sort of, uh, form this this room um, out of out of the bars that like it, it maybe once was for me, but it's it's my uh, my job as a poet to sort of stretch those bars open and start to make this cage a little more well known to me. So, yeah, I love the way you say that. Um, stretch the bars to make this cage. Wow, I love that. Um, <laughs> Thank you. But I feel like that's a very controversial metaphor too, mm -hmm. um, because you'll you'll see a lot of people talking about whether that's something that actually represents them. And I feel like a lot of trans people, I would venture to say most trans people have gone through various stages of being like, oh, my body is like a trap and I hate it. I can't be in it. Um, and then <laughs> maybe five years later or maybe five seconds later, you're like, I love my body and I can do whatever I want with it. I can yeah. be who I am on the inside, on the outside, because I'm trans. Exactly, exactly. And it's uh, it's such, gender is such an interesting thing in, in really that is. notion. <laughs> Where, um, again, something that is so unique about 
being trans. I was I was reading an article or, you know, more realistically, I probably saw it on a TikTok slideshow one night. You um, were reading an article. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, but it was talking about um, the nature of the binary. And like as a trans man, um, I would say and especially as someone who is on testosterone and has mm-hmm. transitioned and I'm currently existing in this this state where for most of the time when I'm around cishet individuals I pass as a fellow cishet man which is very it has been a very yeah. surreal experience um and it what is an that experience- oh, sorry oh, what does that no. feel like it's it, it truly is like surreal and indescribable and I am mm-hmm. I'm still like to this day writing poems about it trying to explore what it really feels like um but it is an experience that I would not be able to have unless I was trans like it yeah. is this unique um form of like double consciousness um in a sense social masking um you know where yeah it's it's something that it's an experience that a cis man could never have. Um, and so to that degree, being trans is something that is so scary and so beautiful. And those things can both, both exist at the same time. And so in the same sense that like the body being a cage, like is a controversial metaphor, you know, um, it's also a part of the truth. You know, beauty cannot exist without this like uh, horrendous coupling. So, yeah, yeah. Um, you use a lot of something that I love, which is grotesque imagery. Um, you talk about like a beach whale and teeth and limbs clashing. Um, and all of those lines create something that's so disgusting, but it's surrounding you who, if I'm correct about this, you don't really um, imagine yourself as being anything in particular in this poem. It's just the things around you. Yeah, yeah. Um uh, it's it's really interesting because uh, I've been told I'm a very not grounded person. <laughs> and yeah, so it's interesting. I probably that told you that at some point. <laughs> yeah, you. I think you specifically. <laughs> we won't talk about my one Earth placement. Um, <laughs> we, we won't. We won't do that. We won't do we that won't here. Do that. <laughs> um, but um, sometimes I am only a part of my own poem for a few minutes and then like my own life you know I suddenly move outside of myself and of more concerned with these images and things that I am coming across rather than my own body and where I'm situated um and I definitely feel that that is reflective in my poetry um but yeah a lot of the uh, the visceral imagery um uh tragically comes from the fact that I really enjoy Hannibal and uh you know I, I didn't I think, think we're gonna bring that up but if we're bringing that up we're bringing that up yeah <laughs> I say I'm someone who thinks that like cannibalism is just such a beautiful um metaphor for uh same-sex romance I I you're not going to I, start I, schizo posting in my interview please <laughs> <laughs> actually um so uh, Ocean Wong, um, who is an incredible contemporary poet, um, uh, wrote a great collection, Night Sky with Exit Wounds. And then um, his memoir um, slash fiction piece right now um, on Earth, We're Briefly Gorgeous. Um, uh, in it, um, he explores the nature of like um, homosexual love as narcissism and like the myth of narcissus and like looking into the pool and seeing your own self as the envision of like your true love um and it's one of those crazy yeah yeah Uh, okay no because a little bit ago um my ex who you know um Mm -hmm. she came down here to visit and all of my friends were telling me they're like oh She's just like you, but like instead of a Gemini, she's a Virgo. 
<laughs> I'm like, wait, what? I didn't yeah. realize this. But now that I think about it, like all of the traits that I admire about myself are things that I'm looking for in partners, which is insane. But yeah. that's allowed? Exactly, exactly. And it's like, it's this strange concept where like, um, you, you know, it's it's somewhat that cliche of like, you have to love yourself first before you love somebody else. Um, but like, I feel like, especially in queerness and understanding like my uh, quote unquote gender journey, um, going from the pipeline of like being a lesbian to being a gay trans man. Yeah obviously quite a difference but like in searching for partners you end up finding these mirrors for yourself and yes. you see yourself reflected in them and in loving them you are learning to love yourself and it is this thing that makes love such a tragic tragic thing because when things fall apart then you you that and that mirror is sort of shattered then those positive aspects of them become um negative in like in retrospect and then you look negatively on yourself and it's this whole mm. game of like untangling you and the relationship and these emotions and um you know gay cannibals so what can i say <laughs> Hey, cannibals. Absolutely. Um, and I did want to circle back to the way you present yourself in this poem, um, just really quick, because mm -hmm. there is, I'm rereading it, and there is one section where you do talk about yourself, but you only talk about your feelings. And mm -hmm. it's that one section that you have italicized and set off to the right of the page. Um, yeah. And that provides such an interesting highlight on it um and i'm going to talk about your formatting a little bit more in a second um but I, I just think it's so interesting that you feel the need to first of all look at the world and you can see in this poem how you're looking at the world and trying to figure out how to write it down on a page which is something that we as writers do so frequently um to the point that you actually yeah. will Picking yourself for being like, oh, this thing that happens, that's happening to me, is just like a setup for a tragic poem that I need to write. Like, that's what the universe wants. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, and you do that here. You you describe all of these things. You describe that anthill on the side of the road. You describe it as like, it's kind of a fundamental thing about Portland is it's all of the nature and all of the city. Um, and then Lewis and Clark is kind of right in between that. Um, so you definitely yeah, see both yeah. of that coming together. And so um, I just love that it's the anthill they found last summer off the 405. Um, that's beautiful. And it's just all of these Thank things you. that you're seeing around you and describing them and describing the depth that you feel behind them, then at the same time, you set off those feelings away from the rest of the poem and give them their own separate, distinct metaphor. Yeah, yeah. I I would be remiss, like, not to mention T.S. Eliot and The Wasteland mm. and, like, the, the quintessential poem you all read in high school that like introduces you to poetry um, yeah. but something has always attracted me to poems that speak through multiple voices um, yes and, oh yeah and as someone um who has autism sometimes that is like how the world feels to me is mm -hmm. um, the, these different sort of social masks and these different sort of personas that I take on in different environments feel as though different voices are talking, different aspects of me are showing light. And yeah, especially um, typesetting off that one section with having the emotions sort of be literally set to the side of like mm -hmm. this is everything that is is happening and that I'm experiencing and then sidestep away for the emotions um you know mm -hmm. just offset them a little bit to the right um but yeah it also definitely shows a testament to like how much I'm involved in the environment and how much I have like 
pushed away those emotions off to the side, just taking up that little bit of space in the poem. And yet it's such a, such a crucial part. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Another thing that you do a lot with your formatting is you have a lot of spacing. Mm. And I really want to ask you about this because we haven't talked about it before. Um, what does that spacing do to you? How, how do you read it? And do you think that there's more to the poem than just the um, spacing and the way that you read it out loud? Or do you think that there's also something symbolic there? It's definitely a, a bit of both. Um, uh, I, in my poetry class this past semester, um, I, I forget like which poet said this, um, but like I will take credit for whatever my audience perceives in a piece. Um, and so it wasn't it wasn't my intent by any mean to do this. Um, but I did have someone point out that this poem and the way that I have set like just single words, like so far apart, like spaced, um, yeah. actually looks like the ants in the anthill. And just oh, these little, I love that. Yeah, yeah. These little things like scattered about and like it goes from a sense of like literal like disintegration into the ground. And I was like, yeah. definitely not what I was going for, but, but absolutely. <laughs> yes, you're right. No, you're you are you're a genius, me, <laughs> you know. Um, right. Yeah. But it, some of it is um painfully literal though actually i i had been trying to play with liminal space more um but i i try to use space sometimes to convey double meanings so like if you yeah. look towards like the third stanza it is i mm -hmm. have um dancers professors and classes all yes. in a line and it literally is because the dancers are communicating as professors which is situated between classes and and so like all those yeah. like betweens and ands um like oh, i'll i'll make that literal um and then absolutely. in like absolutely that ending stanza you have this juvenile righteousness lies between and then i have literally situated it lying between unjust logic and the beneficiary in the, yes. the line that follows um so that's more what i was going for also just like being on the ocd end of the autism oh, spectrum yeah my brain literally like is like this is a pattern that i see and these are the places there's patterns, the there's patterns everywhere yeah. yeah yeah exactly um and i actually was looking at that and i created the shape in my mind from ants and antlers as the base um and then it almost Ooh. is shaped like a scale yeah, with unjust yeah. logic and the beneficiary and mm -hmm. then the bar on top and the ands create the stand because there's always this balance between these two things. And I thought that yeah, that was, yeah. I don't know, is that intentional? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, you're like, you're reading my great. patterns, right? <laughs> yes. Oh no. I see your patterns and I think they're absolutely stunning. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I did want to talk a little bit more about what you mean by unjust logic and then more so the beneficiary. Oh, yeah. Um, well, as as like the 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 poets of, of ye olden days, and I'm talking like the the John Dunn's, you know, or whatever. Oh, like the 1700s yeah. <laughs> the and things stuff like we that. read in class. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, in class. They're like Kublai Khan and stuff like yeah. that, where, you know, sometimes uh for lack of a better term, um, someone was in an opium stupor and just sort of wrote things down and came back to it. And then you look at it and you go, you know, that's pretty good. We'll and I feel like that that's one. just the way you live your life. <laughs> to, a, to a healthy extent. Yes, um, to a healthy extent. But um, but yeah, so the um the unjust logic. Um, 
it's sort of a reflection of that sense of like juvenile righteousness. Um, yeah. This uh, past summer, I read The Catcher in the Rye. Um, mm. And as as a trans man, that was a really, really interesting experience for my gender. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, I remember and, I remember seeing the things that you were saying about it and I'm like I th- this is gonna <laughs> impact the way that you develop as a person yeah as an adult yeah, maybe person not in the best way by any means but you but know some pretty good poetry came out of it oh um, oh yeah absolutely but um but yeah so I was sort of um this poem in general, is a reflection on my anger and how I feel like poetry for me is sort of this act of paring it down, like letting out my anger in its like rawest, realist form, and then slowly sort of shaping that and putting it into the right words to to yeah. soften it and like better understand it for myself. Um, and so I feel like emotions sometimes are like I have this sense of juvenile righteousness this like fiery like I sometimes just want to slam my fists into the ground and destroy things um right and that's that's because of these things that have happened in my past that I feel that I have no control over but have shaped me um you know I recently read the drama of the gifted child by alice miller which has a lot to do with alison bechtel's fun home and like um Mm -hmm. her entire philosophy on um how your childhood upbringing and how your parents treat you affects you well into adulthood and how you develop in your relationships and so things like that that like i had no control over but i know have informed this way that I feel anger. Um, And then the beneficiary sort of being um, who that anger is, ends up being taken out on, who is benefited from this actual destruction and letting this Mm. anger out. And this poetry even, like, are these words hurtful or harmful and for whom um and so both of these things are sort of like nebulous gray areas big things i'm trying to convey in small words but uh, yeah that's poetry at the end of the day and i think that you've seen a lot of things in your life um correct me if i'm wrong of course um but i think you've been in a lot of situations where there have been people who have said and done things to you that were terrible and you have had to continue going on with your life and they just kind of usually fade into obscurity for you and I have to imagine that you're just left wondering what they do get out of that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, the nature of of movement and and travel sort of like as I'm exploring in this poem is like mm. sort of that that hypocrisy of, of movement and staying still at the same time. So much changes and yet nothing changes. And yeah. so by like by trying to shape my my emotions and and everything that's like happened to me through my life that I've like am trying to actively come to terms with um it ends up being this like apothecary of like glass bottles and sometimes those glass bottles are memories or words you know these moments that we can't redo or take back we just end up living with this shelf of glass bottles and Mm. you just have to wake up every day and look at that and go you know, one little thing, and I could just kick this shelf to the ground. I could, yeah, I could yeah. leave glass everywhere, you know. Um, but, but what then, does that actually end up then doing? Those li- I'm imagining, because you do have an actual line of glass bottles with plants in them sitting in your room. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and so I'm just imagining, like, yeah, but this is your room. The only thing you can really do is if you take those glass bottles and you sweep them all on the floor, the only person who's going to step on that glass is you. Yeah, 
Yeah. yeah. And it's sort of like, um, it, it's interesting because you, uh, in your phrasing used, um, a turn of phrase that my therapist has also used. Oh, uh, I'm is, sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. I've done this is, before. I do this <laughs> often. Yeah. It's something <laughs> that has happened to me, something that someone has done to me. And what's interesting mm-hmm. is I have never been able to conceptualize my own life in that manner. Because once again, I'm so concerned with all of these other images and all these other things that are happening outside of myself that I am always more concerned about who is affected by my actions than how other people's actions affect me um so like as much as things may have happened to me in my life I am so disconnected from those things happening to me that like um i it's that's just another like way that the the air is trapped in the bottle you know yeah yeah um and i think it's interesting that you use the word air there um because to me i think of anger as being something that's either so fiery or if you're going to create a metaphor out of it it's something that like has actual substance it's one of those emotions that you can bite into Mm -hmm. but you described as being like air and I thought that was so fascinating because it made me think about the way that I've seen you see anger and you do feel those feelings on such a deep level but they're also it's everything and nothing yeah isn't it? Yeah. Isn't it just? <laughs> Sorry. Isn't it? Isn't it just that? You know. I, oh, uh, yeah. Um, I love that the nature of things is contradiction. Um, oh, so do I. <laughs> I and think so, that's one of the reasons that we get along so well is that yeah. everything is so complicated. And we're like, isn't that silly? Isn't that funny that that's how that works? Or maybe yeah. not at all. Well. <laughs> what's what's one to do about it um I guess we'll move on and just talk about it forever like, yeah yeah no, literally um and so it's interesting because um you know I, I was talking like you know how do you how do you live with anger um huh. and you know the anger being being fire and that being extinguished by water um you know but air Air is something that, like, you breathe. Um, it just is. It's it just part is. of living. Air is waking up every single day and going, this is my life, and I am actively living it. And, yeah. um, you know, breathe in, breathe out, um, and acknowledging that this is the state that I'm existing in. Um, it's yeah. also, like, um, a, a complex like metaphor in the sense that um the 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 corking um has some interesting implications yeah. um because i was thinking about um uh slowly but purposefully corking the air as the process that actually happens um in a wine bottle in which yeah. wine is corked um and so this this stopper that's sort of put in to like trap this emotion and sort of keep it in you mm-hmm. know being the thing that actually erodes and corrupts what is inside and then letting and then um the, you don't know that the bottle is corked until yeah. you pull the cork out and expose it to fresh air. And then the mm. longer it sits there, just the worse the wine gets. And there's yeah. no not knowing that it's corked anymore. Um, mm. And so that's that's something I was also playing with there. Yeah, I definitely love that. I remember, um, I remember there was one time in one of the classes that we had together where we read i think it was how the garcia girls lost their accents yes yes um and there's this one scene in the book where she gets this bottle of wine 
from I think it was some guy that hit on her. I don't remember, but I do remember we were in class and we were talking oh, about I remember this. this. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, we were in class and we were talking about like what it meant and everything. And you were like, the only thing that I got out of this is that she doesn't know how to open a bottle of wine. <laughs> yeah. um, and I know both both of our dads are wine guys, like mm. who may be a concerning extent. <laughs> um, and I think I think that that's a very personal piece of imagery, even though you don't really realize it. Yeah. And, and you know, I, like I that's, that's something that you've gathered from your life. And that's something that has a lot of meaning to you. And I love things like that, where there's a history of why you know this. And then I always try and tie that into how the poem works. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh uh, yeah. No, it's, it's interesting because once again, like the nature of poetry is like, mm. and the nature of like all writing and art for that matter is communication between the artist and the perceiver or the, the consumer yeah. of said art. And so while this can be a line that is has like so many layers and so many memories and so much tied to my own personal experience, at the same time, it is something that can mean something completely different to somebody else who have had their own different life experiences and their yeah. own glass bottles and their own relationship mm. with this metaphor. Um, yeah. And so I, I just think that's a wonderful, wonderful thing about the nature of this. Mm. Right. Yeah. I just love that metaphor of the glass bottle corking and the air being corked slowly but purposefully. Because if I, I don't know a lot about winemaking, um, but if I understand what you're saying correctly, it would be a very slow and purposeful process. You'd be very careful with it to make sure that it's done correctly. Mm. Um, yeah. And then that, that idea of like aging wine and like right. buying, um, buying something specifically to age it. And then just yeah. knowing that you have spent all this money and all this time, um, only for the knowledge that, you know, the past 20 years that you've been living with this, um, it's actually gone bad this entire time. Yeah. Hmm. And I think that that's something that you talk about in the next line right after that section, where you say, long have I felt them move imperceptibly um, beneath the fabric of myself. And yeah. the specific situation that this poem was inspired by, that was a very short-lived thing. Mm -hmm. It was under two years, not even one year, if I remember right. Yeah, But there's a lot of history before that, and there's a lot that's going to happen after that. And I think, I think you just pull in the multiple facets of yourself so well to focus on the situation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's, I, I try to express that in a lot of my poetry. Um, I, and that's why poems being something that can be so short or so long and have such an impact like regardless um in each of my pieces sometimes I'll just try to capture like one moment or two mm. uh, two moments even right. I feel so grand um yeah and so um in that like once again lies this contradiction of um when I first shared this poem um I was uh, told that I should change the word imperceptibly because I'm saying long have I felt them move, which implies that I've been feeling them move for a long time, but then imperceptibly implies that like I have not been able to feel them moving at all. And once again, but it's like, both. It goes back exactly. to that duality. It is both. It can be slow and it can be purposeful. Yeah. I can feel them move and yet they are barely moving at all. Yeah, this yeah. was just one moment and yet it can define an entire life you know absolutely yeah 
vile. It 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 can define an entire life. I I think that that would be the main takeaway of this is just the way that something so small can make you feel so much and so little and be such a short event and be tied into so many other things around you. Mm. I, yeah, I honestly, I think we can leave it at that. (laughs) That, Yeah, that speaks for itself. Amen. (laughs) Well, this has been... A wonderful time. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. It's Thank been great you talking so to you. Oh, the pleasure has been all mine, Bird. <laughs> Thank you so, so much for this opportunity and getting yes. to talk about my piece. Um, and uh, once again, thank you to to Parlay for, for being able to make all this happen. All right. Bye, Dean. Bye.